It's another day here at the Comeback Team Studios. This is your host, Beck Lover, and I have a guest that I'm so honored to have on this show. Someone who has an extraordinary life, a story of escaping to freedom from one of the darkest corners in the world, from North Korea. I'm honored to have on the show for the first time, Miss Yeonmi Park. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Yeonmi, how are you doing? How's everything going? It's going great. I can't really complain about anything after North Korea. <laughs> and we have you, you live in the Chicago area? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So Yeonmi, so we, we're going through very interesting times in the world. There's all types of things that are going on. And mm -hmm. uh, obviously... Most of us don't know what's going on in North Korea, and maybe that's something you can shed some light on. But uh, let's start with your extraordinary life, where it started, how it started, and how you made it to America. Mm. Well, it's such a long story. That's why I wrote a book. <laughs> but I will try my best to make it uh, simpler. What's the name of your book? It's called In Order to Live. In Order to Live by Yun Mi Park. Yeah. Is it available on Amazon? Yeah, it is. So we yeah. will include a link below so you guys can please uh, get a copy of that book. And I've already ordered my copy. So oh, thank you so much. Hopefully one day when we meet, we can you can sign it for me. Oh, that would be an honor for sure. I will hopefully to see you in New York. God willing. When New York comes back, hopefully it comes back. I think both of our cities have a lot of work to do right now. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a... Uh... I mean, that's the thing, like, uh, I initially really, you know, try to bring uh, freedom to my people in North Korea and freedom of speech, all of those things. But I see that the democracy is under attack in so many parts of our, our world right now. So it does feel like we are in this together. You know, it's not like only North Korean people are oppressed or they are the one only need the help. They, we all need to rise together to demand our rights and fight for our freedom. I think you're very right, Yanmi, and I think what people don't realize is that, you know, dictators they they come, they don't just come out of nowhere. You can see them rise into power, but once they get that power, yeah. a lot of people have to die to to get those people out of power. Yeah. You know, and that's why I think even during this current crisis that we're in globally with, you know, the sickness that spread everywhere and government lockdowns, people that come from places like me and you, you know, I'm the first generation of Albanian immigrants who escaped one of the worst regimes in the world. My grandfather fought against that regime in Albania, against the Hoja regime. You know, we are the ones who look at these things that go on in everyday politics where maybe someone who was born in America, you know, and their family's been here for 200 years, they don't realize the freedom and the gift that they have. They don't realize the opportunity that they have. And they don't realize that you have to watch what the leaders are doing because any infringement, even the smallest infringement on our rights as Americans and as people that live in democracies, mm -hmm. you take a right here, you take a right there, you take a right here, all of a sudden, next thing you know, you've lost all your rights. And the only way to get them back, unfortunately, most of the time is through violence. So mm -hmm. I think people like us, mm -hmm. they, they think that, you know, maybe people think we overreact. We're overreacting, you know, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Oh, <clears throat> you know, no, we're scared because we know the history of our people and our families. And that's why I'm so honored to have you on here. So you feel, you feel similar. You see things happening that maybe are alarming to, to, to people living in America that they should be paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, it's not just alarming to me. I uh, so I mean, I just I echo everything what you just said. You know, I often say like, if we were born with both arms, we will never know what it feels like born without arms. So because people were here born with the freedom, they don't really know what it feels like without it. Therefore, they don't really appreciate those we have two arms when we have it. You know, it's like, we don't even notice it. Like, you know, we just born with it. And for like us, we fall for, for those having two arms and we know what life can be without it. And therefore it is 
so scary to in I only like a month I was robbed in Chicago last month. You were robbed. Yeah, and so I was walking on the Michigan Avenue, and with my nanny who's Muslim, uh, pushing a stroller behind me with my two year old son in the stroller. There's like three, two, three uh, African American. I'm not going to say African American. They are from not Africa. They are from here. They were born in America. So black three women. They just pushed me to the corner and then took the wallet out from my purse. So of course, like I'm a fighter. I was like going back to them. I was like, I wanted to stop here. I'm going to call the police. Can you wait here? I'm not even accusing you anything. Just wait here. Then she was screaming at me. You know, she punched me. And then she was screaming at me that I'm a racist. But the the craziest thing is that not even these girls, the people on the street, on the like bus stop everywhere, they all gathered to corner me and calling me that I'm a racist, I'm a crazy, I'm a bad person to accuse these girls to be robbing me. And then they were pre- like preventing me to call the police so these girls could run away. Well, eventually they used my credit card to go to blooming theirs and bought something 4,000 worth of stuff and police officers got a footage of them and I did record them eventually if you if you I mean photos of their face so they are being tried right now they've been in the court because it was like a violent robbery so I'm like the thing was attracted to me is like not being robbed I mean there are any anybody can be a thief right it doesn't matter your Asian or white any there's every culture has a thief so that's I a think, fact yeah, they were like black or not, who cares? They were just thieves. But just how people were responding to it on the street. That was so delusional and that was so not common sense that you just seeing these girls, three of them were much bigger than me punching me, but because they're just black and I didn't get to be a black, that I was just automatically oppressing them. I was, a, I was the crazy and bad racist. Not the people who are like punching me and taking things away from me. And that's the moment when I realized, oh, this is really going down south. And I have a child in America and she's like, can you imagine the worst combination can be? He's like half white and half Asian. <laughs> the worst thing it can be right now in America. And this is when we are, I realized, I mean, right now, like feelings is above logic. Right. Like, There's a lot of division right now between ethnic lines and people are looking into race colors. And it's also being propagated a lot by the media, which is making people feel like they have to choose a side. And it's fueling division yeah. and it's fueling hatred. And unfortunately, you just bore the brunt of some of that and you just experienced it. And uh, um, thank God you're OK. Thank God you're how old you how old your kid? Uh, my son is over just two years old. Wow. He was just behind me. But I just, I mean, I don't even think it's about just some division. I just, maybe the media is telling these people, but these people were rational adults in front of them. Someone got getting beaten by a thief. How are they still not helping me and helping the other people? And this is something so that I never thought America was going to be this way. And I think that's like when I really realized, oh, this, the pro, I mean, so when you hear this about hate crimes, I thought like you, you were almost like, oh, they are making those sensational stories to create division and create hate from each other. And I never in my life thought that was going to happen to me. And that was a reality of our like current situation. And this is like, I think it was way worse than what I expected it to be. It's a very horrible feeling. I mean, uh, you know, New York City has been really hurt badly from everything that's gone on. And it's just a very scary time in America. I don't care what anyone says. It's scary. If you're not worried about the future of this country and you can't see how people are being torn apart, Mm -hmm. that's the first way a destruction of a nation starts. Uh, My my family, my dad's side was also... uh, in a country that was multi-ethnic for the most part, but eventually they were divided against multi-ethnic lines. They fought bloody war. 
some of the countries were more aggressive than the others, you know, the nationalities. But at one point they did leave, you know, they did live a decent time together, not too long, but there was a short period of time where there was a little bit of hope that yeah. maybe all these people could get along and then it turned into one of the bloodiest conflicts in European history, in, in the Balkans. But you and me, you became a very important activist for human rights. You've become a very important activist against uh, human trafficking, which is a very big problem. And your story starts in one of the most isolated, loneliest, probably <laughs> countries you could live in anywhere on earth. So I kind of want to go back and start at the beginning of your life, and then we're going to talk about how we got to the point where, you know, you've been, you've been seen by over 80 million people. <laughs> and I know when you probably started your 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 battle for your own freedom, you probably never thought that you would be this important. And you are. You're very important. Your voice is a voice that needs to be heard and rebroadcast because people need to understand what happens when communism, totalitarianism, when dictators rise, and when people get divided. So you, you were you were born in ninety three. Yes. I was born in, in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Where in North Korea? I was initially born on the northern part. North uh, North Korea. Uh, northern part of North Korea. It's called Hesang. But my father was sent to prison camp. So after that, I was. But how? How? So okay, you were born. Now this area you were born in was this a city? Was it a village? It was a small city in so the border town of North Korea. What are you? What are some of your first memories as a child? Um, I think a lot of things. I think I don't know. Maybe I remember a lot of things from my childhood. Uh, I mean everything. I pretty much remember everything from my childhood. It was like, you know, having my sister, having my mom, having my father, but he was always away, and and he was away because of prison or because he was trying to work trying to find things to things find things to feed his family because north korea supposedly the socialist paradise but in the 90s when i was born like before like i was born in 1990 that time the soviet union collapsed so they were stopped providing i mean helping north korea therefore north korean regime have been cutting the public ration to the people so i mean this is like a center i mean the government center like economy they don't have a trading market or so they don't have any place to make money so that's like when the most like mass famine happened in north korea people were story. starving to death because it's not a capitalist economy you only work for the government you make whatever they tell you you're going to make and you eat whatever they tell you you're going to eat yeah so exactly yeah so they were feeding us until then. And then in the 90s, it's just like, oh, we, we just, they didn't give us any food. Therefore, my father was working so hard in every possible way to feed us. And we are lucky because in that time, in that time in 90s, more than 3 million people died from starvation. Wow. But it wasn't like in Pyongyang. <laughs> it wasn't in the capital area. It was like where we were and the countryside, people's status were not that high. So North Korea, even the socialist I mean, country, they have created this caste system. Classes, and people for the party, certain positions. If their family's involved with the dictator, they get better treatment, correct? Absolutely. So it's a most cat. So there's a big three categories of different caste system, but within them, there's 50, five, zero, like different categories. So that's how unequal it is. is it, isn't it funny how... A lot of times, the, the, the people that end up suffering the most yeah. in communist countries and totalitarian systems are the very people that were the ones pushing for that system. Their fathers and their parents were the ones that believed, oh, communism is going to work, and they fought, and now they're suffering. They're starving to death, and they fought for this dictator and his family to get into power. That's the irony of it. Yeah, I think... <laughs> for sure like nobody been benefited by system other than kings literally even the uncle of kim jong-un gets executed 
So it is a, it is a very brutal system. No one means other than the dictator. Nobody can mean in that system. Let me ask you this. Before, you know, I know we're talking about your life, but your, f- your father and your mother, when the Korean War was happening, mm. did you have family that you got divided from? Did you have family in the South? I mean, w- what happened as a result of the Korean War? Was your family split up? So my parents were born after the Korean War. So they, but their parents, my grandmas, my grandmother is from South Korea. But during the war that she was in China and then went to South, I mean, North Korea. And then, uh, so she never got to see her family. So your mom's mom? Yeah. Ended up as a refugee, China, then went back to North Korea. Then the 38th parallel closed off. Yeah, but the thing is, we asked her, but she thought that back then that communism was better. So she chose North Korea. It's always that illusion of, oh, it'll be fair. We, you know, because yeah. Korea has a very tragic history. You guys were always invaded. You yeah. had, you know, Japan during World War II was very brutal to Korea. Mm-hmm. Then you had uh, issues with China also, if I'm not mistaken, in your past. I mean, China was our big brothers. They were always like, I mean. They helped. They were- yeah, we were like their puppets. Because I guess there was a con- common enemy in World War II of, of Japan invading, I guess. You guys stuck together. You're yeah, right, right. So China was always a bigger brother. And I mean, China was trying to use us to protect themselves from Japan. So what's life like for a young person Yeah. in North Korea? You're, let's say you're a school, you know, what was that like being a young person in North Korea? I mean, very early on in your life, you learn how to not to say things. You learn how to not even think. And how? Like, who's te- who's teaching you? Your own parents are saying, don't say this. Like, I mean, who? who? Yeah, my, my mom literally told me that don't even whisper. Don't even whisper because the birds and mice could hear me. So imagine that as a young child, like. The terror of like, even if I whisper something, maybe my somewhere hiding gonna hear me. Even Versus, in your own, even in your own home. Even in my like under my like blanket. Wow. So eventually, what that does is, like make you not to think, and the education is like helping you not to think. Education is like numbing your brain. In North Korea, like education is not like help you to think critically, but it actually numbs your brain, numbs your logic. So, you know, of course I went to school, but in school, everything that we learn, like in school, they give, they do teach like basic math, a little bit of science, but you can fit at like basic math, but you can never fit at the revolution history of the leaders, like Kim dictators. So like we have to, but the learning about the Kim dictators is like a very manual, like memorization game. It's not like about logical, it's like, it's not about how to think. It's all about what they, which in year they were born and what they, which location they killed, how many Japanese imperialists, what they, which location, how many they killed American bastards. That is like a revolution history of Kim dictators. It isn't about like, what do you think? Like I never heard a question or phrase called what do you think? So when people ask me in South Korea, like, what do you think? I was so confused. I was like, what do you mean? What do I think? Why does it matter? And so in North Korea, no one asked like, that question. So education is like to just like uh, make you be a robot. And that's what they do and produce this, what they call like a revolutionary, you know, armies and so when you would go into class they probably start with some type of pledge of allegiance some type of salute some type of song to the dictator right yeah every song every movie every book everything you see in north korea is about propaganda there's no love songs like i was so shocked when i went to south korea like literally every song talks about love story <laughs> right it's like I, I was literally thinking, so they're going to die without love. Like every single song that doesn't involve any love in it. And opposite in North Korea, every song is about our love for the leader. Or and war or the past or. Only is like very. Destroy the enemy. Oh, yeah, yeah. That includes, but like the conclusion has to come to down ends where we have to die for the revolution and the leader. 
that is always any movie, any genre goes to the same conclusion. And that's when I got some this epiphany when I watched the movie Titanic, uh, the black, you know, DVD that my our family had. I watched it, Titanic. So you had a smuggled version mm-hmm. of Titanic, which if they found you with that, what would have happened to you if they found the Titanic in your house? So it could be public execution or it could be sending to prison camp. So. And how did you get the copy? Do you know? Was it your father? Was it your family? Or so did you get it? No, I was a child. So our uncles had it. And then I think they shared it with it us. So, uh, I mean. Did it, have, did it have Korean subtitles? Uh, could you actually read it or did you just watch it and just kind of imagine what they were saying? Do you remember? No, I think it was either dubbing or had the subtitles. Because wow. I definitely remember the story. Wow. Yeah. So there were a lot of dubbings too. I mean, did you think did you think Leonardo DiCaprio was handsome? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what, like the first thing I checked after I sketched like, is he alive? Because I thought he was going to be executed for that. Because like in North Korea it's such a shameful thing. How can anyone dare to make a movie? out of love story that's just such a shameful like in school we don't learn about shakespeare we don't know what romeo and juliet is and there There's, was no religion right no kims are our religion they are our gods so there is no faith and albania was actually the first where my family fought against was the first eight first atheist country in the world official religion atheism wow so if they found any type of religious scripture you were executed or you were sent to a labor camp, hard labor camp. Yeah, so in North Korea, uh, we do that. We definitely, yeah, you get executed for get, reading a Bible or owning a Bible. But what they created was they were copying Bible and then brainwashing us to make us believe that Kim's are gods. Wow. So like that, you know, Kim Il Sung is a god, so first Kim, he loves us so much that he gave us his son, which is Kim Jong Il. Hmm. Kim Jong Il died, but like Jesus, his spirit is with us forever. Therefore, he knows what we think. He knows how many hair we got. Like he knows literally everything. So even in our heart, we have to be royal. Isn't there a, a, a word for that? Is it called ju- ju- ch- What's that term used? Yeah, that's a self-reliance ideology. What's it called? Ju- like self-reliance. How do you so- say the word? Like jute. Jute. Mm-hmm. That's the idea that they try to program into you guys' brains, right? The ideology of we don't need the world. It's just us against the whole world, right? Yeah, and also what they do is like it's a like self-reliance. So even though it's a socialist country, even though regime do not provide anything, you have to be on your own. You have to like do whatever you, what you need to survive. Do you remember going hungry as a kid at all? Did that happen? Do you remember having an empty stomach and just being hungry and going to your parents saying, Mommy, I'm hungry? I mean, do you ever have memories like that? It's not like memories. Like, it was like my whole existence was being hungry. It's uh, South Koreans are, I think, three to five inch taller than North Koreans. We're the same people. Wow. The reason why we are so short, so much shorter than them is like 12 centimeters are really big gap is because malnutrition. Like any any man whose height is above four feet must go to military service. And like four feet is really short. It's like a child. And people don't grow, they get the growth stunt. And when I was escaping, I was like uh, something like 60 pounds. 60 pounds? Yeah. Wow. And I wasn't that sure to compare to a lot of my fellow defectors. So, so malnutrition is like a main, I mean, that is the only reason why I escaped. I didn't escape to be free. I didn't even know what, what freedom was then. You were starving to death. You didn't care. All I was looking for was a bottle of rice in China. That's like everything that I was looking for. And that's why I risk my life. So literally you're starving to death. So you're like, at this point, I'm dead either way. And yeah. that's what led to you trying to escape over the border. And we'll get to that in one second. Mm-hmm. Um, during your time in your childhood, did you? so how long did you finish education? I mean, how old were you before you escaped? I was 13 years old. Okay, so you did this young. Yeah. 
but I didn't get to go to school that much. Even though North Korea claims it's a free education and free healthcare, of course, like everything is crumbling and not free. So going to school means teachers demand things from you and asking you to submit things, which like a lot of stuff that you need to buy from the black market, we couldn't afford it. So I only like did really minimum schooling, like maybe a few semesters, but most of the days I, wanna, I was not even able to go. In a way, it was good because I didn't get any BS propaganda like my mom. Programming in your brain. Yeah. So I think back then it was very sad that like, you know, my mom went to university. She was very high, high off North Korea in North Korea, women don't go to university. So she was really one of the few intellect among women. And she was always like, so sad that we didn't get education, but now it worked out even better. <laughs> so how many siblings are you? You said you mentioned a sister. Was it any brothers? Any? No, I have just one older sister. And did she make it out too? Yeah, she escaped first. And Thank then, God. yeah, we met each other seven years later in South Korea. Any memories while you lived in North Korea? Did you ever see anything violent? Did you see anyone ever executed, public executions, anything like that? Did you ever see the dictator live? I mean, like, if you meet the dictator in person, they call you some kind of a special person that who has seen the sun because they always compare Kim as the sun of the universe, right? So you have a, such a special treatment. So like average uh, people like us who were less valuable than, valuable than animals, we are not allowed to see the dictator. And uh, I mean, also another thing is like, isn't, isn't execution and sending to political prison camp and torture is like everyday thing. My father was like tortured and sent to labor camp. And my mom was tortured and sent to camp. And, of and why I, were they? Why were your parents sent to camps and tortured? Yeah, so my father was engaging in a black market. But here again, black market doesn't mean selling drugs or selling weaponaries or those things. Selling like black market means in North Korea, selling sugar. Eggs, I mean, flour, rice you know, the, that you didn't get from the government, meat. Exactly. Yeah. I it's know. People, yeah, here when I tell them like a black market, they think like he was some kind of criminal. And he was selling weapons or drugs or. Yeah, yeah, it's like. No, like in North Korea, it's like trading is not allowed. So he was engaging in those things and later like several like copper and uh, nickel. And I think that was the main thing got him sent to prison camp and over 10 years for that. So he was gone for 10 years of your life. Did he get out before you escaped? Yeah, because most of people cannot survive in the camp. No. Usually three months is max. How the hell did they, did he, he survived? He came out a few years later and he was, came out like, oh, there's only scourges left in him, nothing else, it's just bones. But he was that, that, that was, you know, he was that like amazing. He was able to find a way in no matter what. And he convinced the guards that, that he would drive them. So he got out for stick leave, which means that he had to go back when he was here. And during that time, we escaped. He got out too. Eventually, once we escaped, my mother and I escaped to China. A long story, I was separated from my mom, so I found my mom back, and then I brought my father to China. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> now, I, always ha I was always under the impression that if you escaped to China... And because they're communist, mm -hmm. that they would return you back to North Korea. Is that not the case? No, they absolutely do. So they will send you back if they yeah. catch you. They do send you back. So when you escaped to China, what was that like crossing the border? Was it hard? I mean, do you remember that part of your struggle? I mean, it's like a, it, we crossed the frozen river, thankfully, but it was like March 26th of 2007. So even the North Korea cold, the major parts of the river was all like matted. So I was, I mean, we didn't have any gears to survive in the, you know, in that rivers down really fast. It's not like just, you know, soft river. And, and that's not even the part we did. We were 
uh, stand by the human traffickers. But I did not know who they were. They were just really to help. And I was so desperate and woke. I just didn't care who they were. So they were helping us to cross the river, but they, they did that like, I drive the guard in that certain position spot. But the thing is like every 10 meters, there are different guard, like guards. So even if I don't get shot by these guards, the other guys can shoot me anywhere. And every 10 meters is like every guard with a machine gun standing there and it's a shoot to kill order. They don't bother to ask you to stop there. It's like what Kim Jong-un said, shoot them, shoot to kill, right? Right there, if you see anyone in the bag, you shoot them right there. So I think that was like biggest of my fear was being shot. You know, it was- uh, So you had to choose between starving to death or being shot or making it to the other side. Well, <laughs> I mean, I guess uh, because starting with that, I mean, I have been hungry. You, you lose your mind. And you have right? no energy. Yeah, you cannot even like lift your eyelids. Like you have no idea how hard it is to lift your eyelids when you are that hungry. You know, you're like dizzy. You're like you're not in your really own mind. You're like definitely lost there. So that's really there's no dignity in it. That's and I always say like if you starve them like just one day, we you, we lose uh, like civilization, and a few days later we are going to see the monsters in them. And that's like how, what it is, what hunger does to people, you know, without it, we cannot survive. We gotta eat and, you know, food, you doesn't mean like life here, right? It's so much food available here. But for us, it was everything that we wanted and looking for. You get to China miraculously. Mm-hmm. But again, you're in danger if you're arrested by Chinese officials for being there illegally, they will return you to North Korea. Mm-hmm. So what do you guys do in China? I mean, what do you, you're by yourself at this point or who are you with? I was initially escaping with my mom. Okay. And we crossed the frozen river and then we landed in the China. I mean, we arrived at the China side. Then the first thing just happening from my eyes was a Chinese human trafficker was raping my mom. I never seen sex in, in movies. I never, I mean, in, in school, there's no sex education. So, and people in North Korea, you, lovers cannot hug or touch or holding hands. So I never seen anyone kissing anyone. So I didn't even have the word for like, wait. And you're 13. Yeah. And you, your first w- witnessing of a sexual act, unfortunately, is horrific. It's the most horrible thing you could witness. Even yeah. if you saw your mom and dad, it would be awkward and you would feel weird. But imagine someone forcibly doing that to your mother. Yeah. That's devastating. Well, I mean, I think that's the when I lost my faith in humanity. And when I was doing these tricks in my mind that, you know, I was keep, keep almost I like keep telling myself stories to stay sane and to stay I mean, survived the situation and she was raped. Then they were taking us to another human trafficker. And when people in America talking about slavery, I know exactly what they meant, it means because they literally make a stand involve them. And this is Chinese human traffickers and like ask me to turn around and then see my structure, everything. And they make a price for us. Like we are like a bags, we are like puppy. For them and they you're animals, you're nothing to them. You're yeah. not even you're not even human. Yeah, not of course not. Like how many people were there besides was it just you and your mom at this point with the traffickers, or were there other young ladies too? No, well, there were just two of us. And they were they estimated my mom's price to be around sixty five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and my price was around like two hundred seventy dollars, so like below three hundred dollars. I was way more expensive than my mom because I was a virgin and that was expensive in China. So then they separated my mom and myself. So they stole my mom first. Then I was too skinny for them to start. So they were saying, oh, don't worry. They were telling my mom, like, don't worry. We're going to feed her and then we're going to raise her or live a few more years because she's too small and then set her. But as soon as my mom left, 
this human trafficker again trying to rape me. I felt like a crazy person and thankfully he had a wife. So he was afraid that if I was scream too hard that his wife was gonna hear her, hear him. And when your mom got taken away, how, how devastating was that? It was already stored, so I don't even know where mom is. I don't have the contact information. You never knew if you're gonna see her again either. No, never. And imagine in her mind. Yeah. As a parent, what she was going through. <laughs> I know. But these traffickers are so sneaky. They always say, they don't even tell us. Like, they eventually you are going to all meet each other, you know. And we are coming from North Korea. We don't even, I never seen the map of the world. So how do I know how big China really is? I, I think just like China is some kind of little village where I was living. Like, everybody's the all next door. So I didn't even know the gravity of losing her or losing even my sister. Later it all hit me, but back then it was, you know, I, we were just so innocent. We were like coming from different planet, like whatever they tell us, we are gonna believe them. He was trying to weigh me and I felt like crazy. Then he sold me to another human trafficker. So every time they send me to the next human trafficker, my price goes up because they, they make the margin out of me. So they, they sold me to a human trafficker who was in inner part of China. These traffickers were more, more border town of China. So they made more profits of me. And the second trafficker I met, he, he was a Han Chinese who didn't even speak Korean. So I'm like, I don't speak Chinese. I'm 13 years old. I, I'm like by myself and he was trying to rape me. Of course they do. I I bought a knife and there was like it was an apartment. I tried to jump and kill myself. Then that's what he did to me. My uh, mistress, he was going to bring my mom and my father to me. And you know that that point I was stopping a kid. I thought if I sacrifice myself, I can save my parents. So I did become his mistress at thirteen. And he did bring my mom. He bought my mom back from a farm that he stored to. And he brought my sick father uh, six months later after I arrived in China. Wow. Then once they got there, what happened? Uh, my father a few months later died because he was tortured so much in the prison camp. And he had a colon cancer. And because he was eating like bugs eating soaps like eating rocks in the prison anything the human intestine cannot have he was eating those things so he died i was by then 14 years old so i buried his ashes in the middle of the night when everyone was sleeping we could not of course go to cemetery he was like no identification we had to be invisible so I buried him in the middle of the mountain. Then, then like the human trafficker that was bomb me that I thought was a monster. Turns out he wasn't. That's the thing. Like you, you, there's nothing black and white in this world. Even someone is so evil, they still have some good humanity side in them. He didn't let me go somehow. He didn't ask me to pay him or nothing. He was letting me go with my mom in China, which he was by going to be a missionary. Uh, so there were missionaries in South Korea, came to South China to convert us to become Christians. And if we become the believers of God, they would send us to South Korea. So that was like our price that we had to pay to be saved by the Christians, which is becoming a Christian. So they wouldn't have helped you unless you converted. Yeah. So that's like when I was thinking. How did you feel about that? I mean, to me, that's kind of, that's not what Jesus would have done. Jesus would have saved you just to save you, you know? Absolutely, yeah. But like the thing is like now I'm thinking about it, that is as they were so wrong, the way how they preached the gospel. But the thing is that, you know, like back then, like I was so desperate to survive and to get out of China, out of that danger. I would have been believed in rock. Not even yeah, of course, because at any moment, if you get caught, you're going right back to North Korea. You'll probably be executed or thrown into a prison, which is even worse. 
So I was, I didn't care. They were asking me to become a Christian. I didn't even thought there was not a God. I was like, became an unbelievable Christian for them. And I didn't know I was faking it or it was so desperate attempt of me. Whatever it was, I was praying. I was crying when I was like praying. And and when you are desperate, you know, like the will to survive a human is just so powerful. You can do anything. And we did prove our faith to them. And then that's when they told us how to go to South Korea, which means not by flying or with a passport or taking a boat, which means walk crossing the Gobi Desert to Mongolia from China. Wow. And if we look enough to cross the desert, not being eaten by animals, not getting shot by Chinese guards, if we cross the eight wire fences in the desert and go to Mongolia with our steps, with just one compass in our hand. And then that was like freezing to minus 40 degrees in February of 2009, right after Beijing Olympic. And it's desert, it's like Mongolia is so cold. So it was just such a, you know, it was just such a random and gambling, I think, idea to be the freedom and with my life. And you guys did it. We did. We were so lucky. We did wow. not die before we did not get shot. We have made to Mongolia and we got caught by Mongolian soldiers. And they there was so much drama happening and eventually they were willing to help us and they helped us to meet South Korean people and being in the some kind of detention center in Mongolia for like two months, two to three months. Then that's when I flew to South Korea in like April of 2009. So already at the age of what, 14? I was 15 by 15. Then. Yeah. You've done more and you've seen more horror in your life than most people will see in their entire existence. <laughs> well, and, yeah. You've seen, you know, some of the worst that humanity has. Do mm -hmm. you, did you ever believe in God? I mean, even, I mean, you were born into North Korea and religion was illegal, but did you ever believe in a higher power anyway? Did you ever believe in a higher power or creator, someone that gave you life? Before all this, I'm, and we'll talk about what you believe now, but I, as, a, as a child, did you believe in a higher power? Never. I never even knew the word never, a higher power. What, what North Korea did is like, have you read the 1984 by... Of course. I just made my son read it three times in a row. Three times in a row. War is peace. Peace is war. Yeah. So he talks about the newspeak. Double talk, newspeak. So in order, if your language is limited, your thinking is limited because you don't have to understand new concepts. It's like that in North Korea. There's no concept for human rights. So when I heard like there's animal rights, I was so shocked. Like, what the heck are you talking about? Animals have rights. Like as a human, I didn't even know I had rights. And like that, and they don't have love, romantic love in North Korea. We don't, and my father never ever told my mom he loved her or my parents never told us they loved us. Only love that we knew or a lot expressed was written form when we were describing our feelings to a dictator, not other, another human being. And now that you made it out and years have gone by in your life, do you, do you believe in a higher power? Do you believe there's a God? It's, it's, I mean, I was after trying to understand Christianity, I, I was studying my evolution. And <laughs> I mean, the thing is that before there was Big Bang, there was nothing. But like how this something got created is chemistry, right? There was something before nothing. I mean, nothing to something. Big Bang came out from something. And where is that something coming from? It is a definitely mystery. I don't think I am absolutely like, you know. You're sure still you're still searching. Yeah, I think, but the things are almost at this point. I think for me, the one thing I know for sure is that we don't need a God or religion to be a good and have a you know, moral life. But if some people need that help from religion, that's fine. The thing is, like a lot of religion, I do think do cause some kind of violence and oppression and limits our thinking. 
because I mean, I mean, religion really causes a lot of wars. We cannot deny that. And as long as people are being open minded and not uh, judgmental of other religion and other people, other faith, I'm all for it. But some people who take the religion so extreme and become so judgmental and always argue that their way is the only the right way, that is like when I have problems with it, religion. But in general, if people are respectful to other faiths, I'm so okay with that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And do you remember what it was like when you first made it to South Korea? Oh, well, I mean, the first day I do remember for where everything that day, you know, that was the first day I saw airport and I saw this fancy restaurant toilet. I was wondering, like, do I wash my hands in there? Like, what is that thing in the water? You know, never seen that kind of toilet. And, you know, the, the escalators like on the floor I was like, oh, how, why is it the ground is moving? It was everything was like arriving in a new planet. And that was the same day or so they took us to the hospital to do the hair checkup. Because, you know, we were, we, you know, so we never done like x-rays or none like blood work. So we could carry a lot of disease to South Korean population. So before the, this, the intelligence interrogating us, they were making sure that we didn't carry any disease to the South Korean population. So everything was new. Like I had to pee in the cup, you know, I never ever knew what that was. So it was a step into new modern planet. Now I've heard, and I don't know how true it is. And again, I live in an area that has a very large South, you know, mm-hmm. Korean population. Mm-hmm. I have many Korean friends, mm-hmm. and uh, I love you. I love your people. I love your culture. I love everything about you guys. But um, I've heard, and I don't know how true it is, but I heard that when a lot of people make it from North Korea, mm-hmm. and they make it to South Korea. And when they realize the world that they left behind and that they still have family and loved ones that are stuck and trapped inside that Mm -hmm. hellhole, that Mm -hmm. black hole in the world, Mm -hmm. that a lot of them end up taking their own lives. Is that true? They commit suicide. There's so much shock. Like you said, you saw a toilet and you thought it was like, you know, when you realize how behind they are and the world that they're living in and now you're seeing freedom you're seeing democracy you're seeing capitalism you're seeing advanced technology you're seeing south korea is amazing i mean they have everything right they're they're they're, they're like the asian version of america they have k-pop you know they're singing they're dancing it's just you know they have fun Mm -hmm. you're seeing this what was going through your mind and is it true do 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 a lot of north korean defectors do they do, to your knowledge, do they kill themselves? Absolutely. I mean, but not the the reason just you mentioned because the so the South Koreans do kill themselves. So South Korea is the number one country suicide community country among the OECD countries. So South Korea is number one, but North Korean defectors are three times higher rate of killing themselves than South Koreans. So like, definitely number one. A rate in the in the world how but the thing is like it is very mind-boggling right these people went through hair to be free why are they giving up in south korea and it's not i think of course we all have like a survivor skill that we deal with of course it's like every north korean does that but that is not the reason why south korean north korean defectors killing themselves in south korea number one is it's just loneliness. Because when we when they arrive in South Korea, they get this unbelievable amount of discrimination. And they do not know how to make the ends meet. Like my mom, of course, she's like, you know, turning on a computer was a struggle. There's so many steps. And like never had like email, like never lived in this modern life. They don't even know how to text message. They don't even know what email is. Of course, not to mention like doing these jobs all like requires learning these modern skills. It's not for them. And even North Korean defectors try to work in the restaurant as a you know counter cashier or waitress. The South Korean don't use us because we speak with an accent. Even and though you speak Korean, it's different from their Korean. It's a different dialect. 
I know. That's the thing. Like, who cares in America someone speaks British English? Doesn't matter. As long as you can communicate, it doesn't matter. But in South Korea, they care that we speak few words differently. Even if I try to say all the but things. But you, you would think that they would feel some sympathy knowing that you came from North Korea, you didn't want to be born into that system. I thought they would have been a little bit more open-armed and try to help you guys succeed and make it. I mean, you didn't feel any of that? No. Wow. The, the first uh, day I outside of this education center, being in really South Korea with my mom and myself, I, of course, we didn't have nothing at all, right? No furniture, nothing. I was a young girl. I was 15 years old. I was so curious about this thing called internet. I wanted to go to PC room to see what internet was. My mom gave me money, so I went to PC room and tried to enter. Yeah, like, they have a lot of like those computer cafes where there's lots of computers. You pay for the hour. You can use computers, smoke, have a coffee. But a lot of kids use it. The kids go there to- Internet train. cafe. Yeah, internet cafe is not for adults. So I entered it, and of course, I don't know where to pay the money. And they, this guy who owner of it noticed that I spoke with an accent. And he said like, oh, we don't accept the foreigners. And I was like, I had like South Korean citizenship by then. And he's like, no, I'm not a like foreigner. I'm a South Korean citizen. I was like, no, you're not. And it's like, no, I'm not like from your brother. I'm, I'm from North Korea. I'm the same Korea. And he's like, no, you're not. You're not allowed here. So I got kicked out of this internet cafe. And after that, I was depressed that that several months that I couldn't really go outside to look at people because I was scared by people. And you're thinking, these are my own people. What the yeah. hell? The, the war and the politics divided you, but you're the same people. Well, I don't think that's the mystery about South Korea. And that's, I think, so many people, why did you come to America? It's like, there's a reason, even though people just think America is the most not <laughs> inclusive country but this has been the most inclusive i've ever been to in my life say that again this has been the most inclusive and compassionate country i've ever been to and that's why i'm ready to die for this country i cannot wait to become a citizen of this country it's going to be my lifetime moment this country really provides home to everyone who is willing to accept the democracy and the value of this country and the value of this country is so amazing. It's the best thing I've ever heard and the best thing that's ever happened to humanity. And that's why I'm like, that's why Northern Defectors killing themselves so much in South Korea. And some of them even return to North Korea to even get killed. That's what they do. They, they do even redefect from South Korea to North Korea and willing to die. Wow. <sighs> How did you make it to America? Was it legally, illegally? Did you apply? <laughs> did you apply for citizenship? I mean, give us yeah. that story. That's a very good question. I was in South Korea for five years. I was studying in the university. and Now, were you in Seoul? Mm -hmm. I you, was you're in, in the big city. Yeah, I was in Seoul going to university and started doing this media in the in the media. Then I did a few speech in the Western world. I was learning English and I didn't even think I was going to be, become a human rights activist for the full time because I was studying criminal justice in my university. I was more you know, going to the a different sector than like being human rights world. And one speech that I gave you just said like that, that thing got like 80 million and later like 300 something million, it blew up the website. That speech really, not only be, I was becoming famous, but myself, I, that's when I realized, oh, people actually care about North Koreans. Just they didn't know that we, our stories because the media has been always presenting about the dictator or the news and they didn't really show the humans of North Koreans. And that's why people didn't really do much about this issue. So that, after that speech, I got a book deal with the Penguin. And my they, mom, my mom worked for Penguin. Oh, I see. Yeah. My mom works for the accounting department. She works for Pearson now. Oh uh, yes, I think mine was also with the, really okay Pearson. Okay. Because they bought Penguin. Yeah, yeah. So you so, see, we connected. My mom sent you the check. 
<laughs> Great. So yeah, with that, I got a O1 visa. And during that time, I also got accepted to the Columbia University in New York. Wow. So that O1 visa was, you know, student I, I, student I, visa. Is that what it is? No, it's called a it's called a Justin Bieber visa. It's like an extraordinary visa. So the U.S. gives that visa to the people who think they think that it's going to be valuable to this country, like the scientists. Wow. The TV personality. So why did they think you would be valuable for your activism? I I think so. I think because I was a media personality and I was a very rare case of uh, speaking fluent English and uh, doing this work. And not many people. I think I think there's they thought not many of me was existing in America. <laughs> so they did give me the O one visa. So from O one visa. It is very easy to get green card. So once our lawyers filed it, I got the green card within like 10 days or something. It was such a quick process. So I got green card before I got married, for sure. A lot of people think I got married only because of green card. It's like, no, I got No, I love my husband. Yeah, <laughs> way before then. So I was, I know how fortunate I am to get own visa and getting that um getting that green card but the thing is like again about america see it's not like this is a greedy country only wants people like justin bieber who's ready to come in they give out or want even some girl from north korea it doesn't even have money and this is the value of this country that i admire the most it's not like the most material materialistic country that other people think of as america is it's not like this country has values and has morality. And I knew it in first hand, they do care about this, these social justice issues. So yeah, that one was a life-changing experience. I came to America and I relearned really about the world. And you went to Colombia. Yeah, I went to Colombia. You graduated. I mean, this year, but I didn't go to graduation because of the COVID. It was pretty sad. Yeah. Do you miss New York? Nope. <laughs> no, I do miss people. People, I miss people in New York. But the city itself, like you say, I mean, I love the city. It's so beautiful. But uh, where I lived right now, like, it was got really so much. And, and it just like, I and the crime near Colombia was so bad. Like, do you remember the Barner students got stabbed? Last year. Yeah, yes, I do remember that. And I'm very familiar with the area. <clears throat> if you think it was bad last year, you should have seen how that area was 20 years ago. Really? Oh, my God. But so it, hopefully it looks like it's going back, on, unfortunately, going back the other way. New York has a lot of problems right now. Yep, that's why I don't miss it. I, so I, congratulations I, on graduating. You got a degree in what? In human rights and political science. We need more young me's out there. <laughs> Thank you. How did you end up in Chicago? Did marriage take you there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You met your husband in school? No, I met him in New York. He was already working, but he was going back, back and forth in between cities and moved here once grad after graduation. That's amazing. And um, so... I mean, you just there's been so much you've you've been through, and you never gave up. What do you think? You know, you have these people, and I, I'm not picking on them. And mental health is a real issue. Mm. And you know, like you said, for some people, they find that hope that they need in spirituality. Some people don't need that. You're clearly someone that didn't need it. But <laughs> what do you think? I feel like the only reason you're still here is because you had a reason, and I do believe in a higher power. And I believe unless that higher power says you, it's your time to die, nothing can kill you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that higher power puts people through the worst situations to make them the best people on earth. And I think you're one of them. I really do. I mm -hmm. think you, everyone needs to buy your book. Everyone needs to read your book. Mm -hmm. I think in today's world here in the U.S., there's a lot of anti-American hatred. People want to rewrite history. People, you know, listen... 
we can't deny the the horrors that happened in this country when it first started. We can't deny that. That that's a part of the social fabric. It bothers me, you know, but you know, we have to stay united. We cannot hate each other. We cannot kill each other. We have to know that there's nowhere else out there that even comes close to this country. I know that. You know that. So instead of trying to destroy this country, let's fix it. Let's not change it completely. Let's fix a few things. Maybe there's some bad police out there. No, there is some. Not maybe. There are some bad police out there. There's bad human beings in every single job on earth. Exactly. I don't think that's enough justification to burn the entire country and destroy it. And communism never works. It has never worked. And yeah. these are the things that I think are upsetting not only to myself. I think I think we're on the same page. I mean, the thing is, like, really what is shocking to me is, like, a lot of Marxists, socialists, Maoists, Leninists, attack me so much and they do try to give a character assassination that how I'm a liar, how I am a propaganda puppet of the West, how I'm a CIA agent. So until, so North Korea made this documentary, I mean the video about me using my relatives to shame me and denounce me. And you had family still in North Korea? They all vanished afterwards. Like three generations of my family is gone, but until then, the what as is as horrible as that is, mm -hmm. they're probably better off not living no more. To be honest with you, I, me and myself, to be in that type of world that you just described and that I've heard from my own family members, yeah, I'd rather be dead. Yeah, I mean that's why we were always carrying the lasers and poisons with us when we were escaping. Like whenever we get caught, it was the best thing that could happen to us. Like we would kill ourselves as soon as possible. We wouldn't like. So you saw videos of whatever family you had left. What, like cousins, uncles, aunts? Everybody. From my mother's side, my father's, father's side, even our neighbors is on the YouTube. But the, the, what is crazy about the West is that until that video came out, because I spoke English, people were saying, oh, she's not North Korean. She, how can she speak English? So they were like, you're not a North Korean. That was a conspiracy theory. Then North Korea thankfully released that video saying that I'm a North Korean. They showed them my birth certificate and showed them my father exactly the same name. So I am verified by the regime to be a North Korean. And how, how this like in this country right now, so much fake news and they, anyone denounces the socialism right now or like going okay, like praising the Western civilization and the Western countries that I'm some kind of becoming a puppet of the West that I don't even have my own minds. And this is like what's so challenging in my work is like, as long as I, I don't fit their political narrative, like I'm still not legit anymore. And it, it is really, it's really sad, like even, even human rights, like I was never in, even interested in talking about even US politics. So my area is North Korea, this is it. But in order to North, serve North Korea, we got to serve Chinese like CCP Communist Party. And to talk about Chinese like CCP and then like all these mainstream media, like New York Times, CNN, I mean, Hollywood, everybody's getting paid by China. So there's no way I can serve North Korea without talking to these like main major corporations. And, and they, I mean, the people like really, like why there are no, no movies like uh, about the Holocaust? There's so many blockbuster movies or major Hollywood movies or Holocaust, but not on North Korea. There's a reason in it, because of China. They That's correct. Not. There's not a lot of anti-communist movies. There's not. But not even anything cynical about Chinese China right now. All the villains, if you look at Hollywood movies, are white guys. And all the heroes are like whatever the color of the people they want to represent. And it's like that, like they they were fighting the social justice, but they're making- well, a lot, Most of the bad guys in movies are Muslims and Arabs, nine out of 10 times. Used to be, it's not, it's, I don't think so. These, these days I, I look at Hollywood movies, it completely changed. I mean, that's a good step, but the thing is like they, but they don't now, they don't have to demonize white men because they had a, like, you know, bad treatment by the Western countries it doesn't give them like reason to treat us 
um, treat these people back in that way. Do you feel that your life is still at risk at, at any moment? I mean, do, do they they have assassins out there, the North Koreans? Oh. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I get warned by intelligence all the time. It's like they're always like, "Oh, you're it's not safe." But I mean, like. I'm like fighting against a country. I'm fighting against the most brutal dictator in human history. Like he kills his like half brother in Malaysia in the foreign soil, and he did on purpose to show like how how much he doesn't care what we say. Whatever he thinks he's. It's just funny how people go along, and that's what's been making me worried about everything that's been happening in our own country yeah. and around the world when it comes to. Some of the excessive overreach, in my opinion, in response to the disease that's out there. I don't want to mention it because it always messes up the show. But with everything that's been going on with current events, this is what I tell people. I don't understand. I never understood how did communism win in my family's country where they came from. And I never understood how it won in your country. But I am starting to see it, I think, here. Yeah. How it happens. It doesn't happen overnight. It's like a slow tide that moves in and drowns you. And it when it takes us it takes one generation to to you know break down democracy and freedom it doesn't take that long like i was saying in my TED talk like north korea it took only three generations north in north korea to make north korea into georgia versus 1984. but it wasn't actually it was it took just one generation of my grandma when they stay silent and they started fearing what they say and censoring their speech and then when these powers come and silence them, it just took one generation. And like in my generation, like those young pigs in the animal farm in the book, I didn't even know what were the alternatives. I didn't even know the world was different than what, what I was. Seeing. How much do you love? How much, how, do, how much do you respect the work of George Orwell as someone that was born into a totalitarian country. How accurate do you think those stories and those descriptions in 1984 in an animal farm are to the reality of what the state tries to do to your mind when you live in a place like North Korea? I know it's like, uh, so he talks about this Winston, right? At the 1984, when he comes out, their goal is not to make you kill you. Their goal is to make you take your humanity away, make you numb, hollowness in you. Like that's when I was like, whenever I read like the 1984, I was thinking about my father so much. That was like, my father was such a genius who would survive in whatever circumstance. When he came out of the prison, he was singing songs like, I regret so much. I didn't like uh, plant more uh, trees for like your leader i couldn't believe it like that's what they did to my father he, he would, would sing those songs even though he had gone out of the camps and made it and to he china meant it. he meant it he meant them they, they destroyed his brain yeah they didn't like so this is like what i'm what georgia or did is almost like he's a prophet from a future whenever humanity choose this direction we lose our humanity we can never be who we are like people keep asking what does it mean what does freedom mean to you they keep asking me and like i mean freedom is the only thing allows to be human and being different than animal being human when you're born doesn't mean you're human there are things that you have to be free first and i mean animals are like i mean when you we are like in north korea our thinking level wasn't anything different than even dog because we were not allowed to, and we were never practiced to practice that critical thinking scare. So like people hear like, oh, you, they think like they knew all of it when they were born, but it's not. And so it's like, it, it is truly horrifying right now how to keep people to having, talking about this diversity, but they do not talk about the diversity of thoughts. They will not have a diversity of some sorts of the, different color of the skin. And that's the, what that matters. That's like what diversity means to them. But diversity of thoughts is like what makes us to, you know, moving forward and be the civilization that we created in America and a lot of other, other countries in this world. You and me, the name of your book one more time. It's called In Order to Live. In Order to Live by Yunmi Park. 
that's definitely going to be a very important book. And um, what about movies? Have you ever seen the movie They Live? With yeah. Rod, with I, I really hope you'll watch that movie. I love to. It's one of my favorite. Yeah. And you, I think you're gonna love it. It's a it's a very fun take mm -hmm. on a very Orwellian style movie. I think you're gonna love it. Okay. It's called They Live, mm -hmm. and it's starring Rowdy Rowdy Piper. He was a wrestler, famous wrestler in America, and Keith David. Phenomenal movie about the system being controlled. It, it has an alien spin on it, but still, you see the totalitarian technique. Mm. It's you're gonna love it. You you gotta watch that movie. Yeah, I, I look. That's forward. your homework. Yep, that's perfect. Thank your you. your book is in order to live. This movie is called They Live. They Live. Okay. Wow. Um, I think that you know I. I held back tears on this. I'm going to be very frank with you. I don't know if you know. I think my technician knows. I felt very connected to your story. One book that I loved mm -hmm. that I read in high school was One Day in the Life of Ivan Denesevich. You ever heard of that book? I heard about it. It's about the life of a prisoner in the gulag of the mm -hmm. Soviet Union mm -hmm. and what he went through in one day of his life in that prison. And I always pictured my great-grandfather uh Ali Braha, that was his name. And he did sorry, Brahalia. Brahalia, that was his name. He spent twenty eight years in a camp. Mm -hmm. And I always said, This is my, my great grandfather. I never got to meet him. He had a very tragic life. But this is the closest I'll have to knowing what his life was like. Mm -hmm. My cousin Adrian, who grew up in communist Albania and was happy and young in his early I think he was 19 or 20 when the dictator fell and the Albanians took the statue down and they took back their lives and they took back their freedom and it, what a, what, how backwards they were, how far behind they were. They've come a long way. They're doing much better. It's such a beautiful country and God willing, I want to bring you there one day to speak to the Albanian people because they will love your story. And if anyone can feel that story, it's them. But one funny story my, my, my cousin told me was he had, f you know, Albania's on the coast and mm. he was walking on the beach and I guess a Coca-Cola bottle <laughs> had washed from either Italy or Greece. It came on the shore. So he found this as a young boy mm. and he was filling it with juice and he was showing all, the, oh my God, he has, you know, he has Coca-Cola. But when an adult found out, yeah. what are you doing with this glass? If they find you with this bottle, they're going to kill your dad. They're going to put him in jail, you know, to be completely controlled. For the yeah. government to tell you you had one pair of pants, yeah. they were starving half the time. They had to eat bread that was harder than a rock, and they used to soak it in water to make it soft. People don't understand. Yeah. Communism can never work because you will never work as hard as me, and I will never work as hard as you. Yeah. But... There is a social obligation in certain aspects. I agree that, you know, a strong, powerful country should take care of those who are weak, not that, not those that are lazy. But there should be some social responsibility and help, but there shouldn't be an overreach. Government should be as small as possible, in my opinion. Yeah. The only thing I've only been upset with with my, with my country is sometimes I feel we go to war when we don't have to. That's about it. Sometimes I feel there's certain wars that we didn't have to go into and people died, not in our country, and other countries that maybe they lost their lives. I, I'm for peace. I've lost a lot of family in war. And I believe that that should always be the complete last option if you are under attack. Not, mm -hmm. you know, for example, yes, there was terrorists in Afghanistan. And yes, they had to take them out. But, but the Afghani people who maybe just want to live their lives, they paid the price for a group of people who weren't even elected by them to be their rulers. You, you get my point? Mm -hmm. So there's always that collateral damage, as they call it. And I believe so many innocent people die. And that's why it's important for us to hold on to our freedom. Because if America goes down, there will never, ever, ever be freedom again on this earth. I can promise you that. I, I Yeah, definitely. Would you agree to that? Yeah, this is the last hope. This is the last hope. I like the way you said that. I think we got to be free 
and let me lose, let this country go. I mean, I don't know what country can. I mean, no country can combat China. Well, I'm with you. I will fight and die for my freedom in this country and for the freedom of others as long as I live. Yeah. And for our children, I have four year olds. I have six year olds. Mm -hmm. It's not about me anymore. It's about their life. And we will not be like、mm -hmm. our well, my grandfather and great grandfather. I'm very proud of them. They fought to the death against the communists. So、mm -hmm. I'm very proud of my family. They always stood against them. But there were others that were weak. There were others that became collaborators. There are other people who visit communist countries in my family, long distance, like not close cousins, but far away. Oh, do you want to go to Cuba? No, I don't want to go to Cuba.、Mm -hmm. I do not want to go to Cuba. When、yeah. Cuba falls and becomes a free country, then I'll go visit Cuba. I will not spit on the ashes of my ancestors, and I will not spit on the ashes of my father and my great grandfather. And their families, how they fought and suffered and died for the freedom that you take for granted. And when you visit a communist country, you're spitting on the face of every American soldier and every person in the world who gave their lives to be free and fought against totalitarianism and communism. And that's why I will never visit Cuba, ever.、Yeah. And I love their cigars, and I don't smoke them. <laughs> Someone gives me one, different story, but I will、yeah. not buy them. <laughs> you and me, I think this is a beautiful place for us to 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 close our first time、mm -hmm. together. I pray to meet you in real life. Thank you.、Yeah. Uh, I would like to, you know, I'm sure you're going to post on your Instagram when you become a citizen. <laughs> I will definitely. If you if you come to New York and you don't call me, it's your loss, not mine. Trust me. <laughs> New York City is my playground, so please, when you come to New York, give me a call in advance.、Mm -hmm. I would like to set up something very nice, and、um, hopefully meet your husband. Maybe you can meet my wife.、Mm -hmm. I will be honored to host you whenever you're ready. And in the future, let's talk about Albania. I really want to get you out there when things calm down. I think it's very important for the Albanian people to be reminded,、mm -hmm. not just from the Albanian experience, but from the、mm -hmm. Korean experience.、Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that you know, obviously, and we'll close it with this. You know, my grandfather didn't get to hear his brother's voice for thirty years,、yeah. but communism fell, and a little bit before my grandfather died, he got to see his brother again. He got to see his sister again.、Mm -hmm. He got to see Albania,、mm -hmm. and I was happy that that happened before he passed away. And、yeah. I can only imagine what it's like for all those Koreans who now have family members that are passing away, and they will never ever hear their voice again. It's been fifty, sixty, seventy years, and once that generation goes, those bonds that are left between North and South are completely gone. It is come Sami da, right? Yeah. That's how you say thank you, right? Thank you. So, folks, this is by far one of the most inspiring guests I have ever had on my show. Yonmi is the definition of the human spirit: one who never gives up, one that never surrendered, one who found it within her heart and her very existence to keep fighting for survival. She is proof that no matter what you have been through, born into a totalitarian country, human trafficked, witnessed horrific things at a young age, went across a desert. <laughs> Experienced the opposite of what she expected in South Korea. Fought to get to the U.S. She is now an activist for people around the world who suffer. She is the true definition of a comeback story. That no matter what happens in this life, as long as you have air in your lungs, you can always make a comeback. Comeback. Yunmi Park, get the book. It's in the link below. You can't afford not to read this book. Thank you so much. Till the next time, Beck Lover signing off.